For two years, I lived in the secret world of codes and code breakers. My fascination with the subject began with my love of puzzles. Secret codes are where puzzles meet politics, deciding the outcome of battles and toppling governments. The story of codes is all about an intellectual arms race that has culminated in a sophisticated science involving esoteric maths, satellites and supercomputers. So perhaps one of the best ways to understand code breaking is to go back in time to an age when code breaking was done with pen and ink, but when it was still a matter of life and death. Four hundred years ago, this letter, a page of apparently meaningless symbols addressed to Mary, Queen of Scots, landed on the desk of this man, Francis Walsingham, England's greatest spy master. Walsingham was the equivalent of both Home and Foreign Secretary to Elizabeth I. His main responsibility was national security, a job he took very seriously indeed. He would have been chilly and godly and verging on the fanatic. Walsingham is the spiritual father of the British Secret Service. He ran a network of spies throughout Europe and established a school for codebreakers in London. Walsingham takes espionage, intelligence, counterintelligence, communications intelligence, cipher intelligence. He takes them very seriously indeed. He spends a lot of money on them. He gets a lot of money from the Queen to spend on them. He gets a lot of his own money and spends it on them. Walsingham's greatest test was to come from Elizabeth's own cousin, the staunchly Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary had fled to England after Scottish Protestants had evicted her. Elizabeth offered her sanctuary, but on Walsingham's advice, she also put her under house arrest. Walsingham was right to be wary. Many English Catholics hated the Protestant Elizabeth and regarded Mary as the rightful Queen of England. She is beautiful in essence. She has a charm, she has an ability to say the right thing. She is impressive and even in her own lifetime, noble young gentlemen are, are prepared to die for her, for this somewhat romantic figure. By the winter of 1585, Mary's charisma was working overtime and a plot was being hatched to help her. A group of young idealistic English Catholics met in a pub called The Plough in London. Their leader was a country gentleman and bon viveur called Anthony Babington. He had once met Mary, fallen under her spell, and believed it was his mission to rescue Mary and restore Catholicism to England. He wants a foreign invasion, some big powerful Catholic power, to storm ashore in England with an army. He is prepared with a group of friends to assassinate Elizabeth, and he's prepared to, to rush Mary's prison and liberate her. First, Babington needed Mary's blessing to proceed, and so had to get a letter to her. But Babington knew that if Walsingham discovered its contents, Mary and all the plotters would die. It was crucial that the message be unreadable to all but sender and receiver. So Babington turned to a form of encryption which lies at the heart of all ciphers from the internet back to the ancient world. It's called substitution. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Kama Sutra suggested splitting the alphabet into pairs of letters. So to encrypt the word cow, C is substituted with its paired letter Z. 
O with H, W with D. The pig pen cipher used by the Freemasons substitutes letters for symbols according to this grid pattern. So cow would now look like a series of strange lines and dots. The German Enigma machine in World War II simply substitutes one letter for another. But this time, electrical wiring meant that the rules for substitution are far more complicated. Even today's internet encryption relies on the substitution cipher, except that the rules are more complicated still. As for Babington, back in the 16th century, he relied on the so-called monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Now here you can see Babington's list of substitutions. So if he wanted to write the word Mary, instead of writing M, he would write this double slash. Instead of writing A, he'd write this zero. Instead of writing R, we have this strange P. And instead of Y, we have the figure eight, Mary. Babington chose this cipher because Mary also knew what the symbols meant. It was a cipher used in small and very select Catholic circles. And this is what the message in entirety would have looked like, a jumble of apparently meaningless symbols. Having disguised the meaning of his message, Babington now set about hiding its existence. This is known as steganography, and for centuries people have come up with ingenious ways of concealing messages. The Greeks shaved the hair off couriers to reveal secret messages that had been tattooed on their scalps. Medieval Italians had an ink that seeped through eggshells. Today, steganography is more popular than ever. Computer programs can take an innocuous digital picture, like this one of me as a baby, and hide a secret message in it. To hide the existence of his message to Mary, Babington hired a courier, a fellow Catholic sympathiser called Gilbert Gifford. Gifford's steganographic idea exploited the fact that Elizabethan drinking water was notoriously unsafe, and instead the population drank vast amounts of beer. Every week, as a matter of course, several barrels of beer were brought into Chartley Hall, the house where Mary was held captive. Gifford stuffed Babington's letter to Mary inside the bung of a barrel. Then one of Mary's small entourage would retrieve the letter without arousing suspicion. This for Mary is a breakthrough. For months she's been out of contact and suddenly she can start receiving letters from her agents. And so when Babington wants to start conspiring, a mechanism exists by which he can write to Mary and she can write back to him and they can exchange details of the plot. By the summer of 1586, for the first time in 20 years, Mary had reason to be cheerful. She might at last escape and realise her long-cherished dream to be Queen of England. But Mary and Babington were up against the tough and uncompromising Francis Walsingham, who had spies everywhere. They should have known to trust no one, including their own courier, Gilbert Gifford. He is a strange character, an international man of mystery, but what's clear here is that he is a double agent and he is working for Walsingham. In fact, Gifford copied Babington's letter and then sent it to Walsingham before passing the original letter on to Mary. Potentially, Walsingham now had evidence of treason, but first he had to try and decipher the letter.
To do this, he employed a shadowy figure called Thomas Phillips. Only one description of Phillips survives, saying he was 30, slender, and eaten in the face with smallpox. More importantly, he was one of Europe's finest code breakers. At first sight, the problem of deciphering Babington's letter appears insurmountable. There seems to be no way for Phillips to know which letter of the alphabet each symbol represents. As far as a code breaker is concerned, you could take any of the symbols in the encrypted text, let's say a inverted triangle. Now that could represent any of the 26 letters of the alphabet from A to Z. Now you have to check every single one of those possibilities and once you've done that you move on to the next symbol, let's say the fence symbol. Now that could represent any of the 25 remaining letters and once again you have to check each of those 25 possibilities. And once you've done that you move on to the next symbol, let's say the square, that could represent any of the 24 remaining letters and so on and so on. Now when you multiply all of these possibilities together, 26 times 25 times 24 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, the total number of possibilities turns out to be 400 million billion billion. So even if Phillips had worked night and day, trying one possibility every second, it would still have taken longer than the age of the universe to decipher the letter. It appeared that Mary was safe. That is, unless Phillips knew a shortcut. Thomas Phillips was the first great English code breaker. But code breaking itself is a science that dates back to the 9th century. I've come to Istanbul in Turkey to see the only known copy of the first book ever written on code breaking. It dates from around 850 AD and its author was an Arab scholar called Abu Yusuf Yaqub al-Kindi. He lived in Baghdad and was head of the so-called House of Wisdom, at that time the world's greatest university. I'm with Dr. Mohamed Muriati, who discovered Al-Kindi's greatest work, his treatise on code breaking or cryptanalysis. Al-Kindi was responsible of the House of Wisdom, where a lot of translation is going on from all uh, other languages of the world. And some of the translated books were encrypted. They were obliged to uh, invent cryptanalysis in order to understand what is written in these manuscripts. This is the Suleimani Library in Istanbul, where Dr. Muriati discovered Al-Kindi's treatise on code breaking. It had been lying here unread for centuries. The library contains thousands of rare Arabic manuscripts. Al-Kindi's book was brought to us from the vaults. Thank you. So this is the, the famous book. I was really amazed when I read it for the first time and I, I was astonished how they had all this knowledge at that time. That's uh, 1,200 years ago. Al-Kindi realized that when we write, the letters of the alphabet do not appear randomly. Instead, they follow certain statistical patterns. Some letters will be more common than others. Some will often be followed by a companion letter, and so on. After analysing hundreds of manuscripts, Al-Kindi specified these patterns with mathematical precision. This marks the birth of cryptanalysis, the birth of the science of breaking codes? I think so. I think that this manuscript is really the father of all manuscripts on, uh, on this science. And I have seen uh, for seven centuries uh, manuscripts referring to it.
Of course, Alkindi's discovery, which is now known as frequency analysis, is as applicable to English as it is to Arabic. This bar chart shows how often each letter of the alphabet appears in virtually all English writing. For example, X and Z appear less than 1% of the time. T, the second commonest letter, appears 9.1% of the time. And E, the commonest letter of all, appears 12.7% of the time. To show how universal this law is, I did a frequency count of Hamlet's famous soliloquy, to be or not to be. Sure enough, it fits the pattern almost exactly. I then did a frequency count of an article from The Sun, entitled School Dinner Lady Had Me For Afters. It too fits the prediction, proving that Shakespeare and The Sun use each letter of the alphabet in the same proportion. They just arrange them differently. This is invaluable information for a code breaker. If the substituted symbols appear in the same proportion as the letters they replace, the code breaker can crack the code. But there is a way to defy frequency analysis. If the message is very short, say, will kill Liz and crown Mary, the letters appear in proportions that don't match the average. Fortunately for Phillips, Babington's letter to Mary ran to several pages. Now Phillips, being a master codebreaker, would have used frequency analysis, as invented by Alkindi, to decipher Babington's message to Mary. He would have started by looking for the most common symbol in the encrypted message. Now the most common symbol turns out to be this loop with a tail. So this loop with a tail probably represents the most common letter in English, the letter E. The second most common symbol on the encrypted page is this backwards three. So that probably represents the second most common letter in English, the letter T. The third most common symbol, that's a ring, that probably represents the letter A. Now, Philip sort of carried on with this frequency analysis, but already we can make some sense of what the message says. Down here we have T something E. That something, that mystery symbol, probably represents the letter H the word the, the most common three-letter word in English. Now, with a bit more analysis and a bit more guesswork, you'd probably figure out that this says tragical execution. And Philip sort of carried on doing this, deciphering the message bit by bit, revealing Babington's murderous plot. Phillips probably took less than a day to decipher Babington's letter. Babington, believing his cipher to be secure, had explicitly detailed every aspect of his plan to rescue Mary, get support from foreign Catholics, and assassinate Elizabeth. He wrote, Six noble gentlemen will undertake the tragical execution of the usurper for the zeal they bear the Catholic cause. Walsingham now had evidence of Babington's intentions, but this wasn't enough. Simply receiving a letter from a plotter didn't necessarily imply that Mary was guilty of anything. Walsingham and Phillips needed one more crucial piece of evidence. And what they wait for is a letter from Mary saying that she approves the plot, she will go along with it, and she obliges them by writing such a letter. Mary's letter said, Set the six gentlemen to work. Upon the accomplishment of their designs, I may be suddenly transported out of this place, and that all your forces at the same time be in the field to meet me. And that's the famous gallows letter. Phillips drew a gallows on it because this was the one that at long last was going to get her. Walsingham moved swiftly. 
Babington was arrested and under torture confessed everything. He was then executed with the full horrors of English law for what happens to traitors. Drawn into the streets, hanged but cut down alive, disemboweled and so on and so forth. It was very, very grisly and almost certainly Elizabeth had a hand in making quite sure that this execution was going to be slow and painful and very bloody. Back at Chartley Hall, Mary was oblivious as to what was going on. A few days after Babington's death, she was allowed to go riding. In the distance, she saw a group of horsemen arriving. She thought they were her rescuers. In fact, they were Walsingham's agents coming to arrest her. was brought to trial here at what used to be Fotheringhay Castle. This would have been the Great Hall and the trial took place in a small room above it. In her defence, Mary claimed that she had no connection whatsoever with Babington and his conspirators. However, during the trial, the deciphered letters between Mary and Babington were read out aloud. It was the most damning evidence imaginable. The court found her guilty of treason and condemned her to death. No longer able to protest her innocence, Mary realised that all she could do now was to die a tragic and noble death, turning herself into a martyr. The execution itself was botched in that it took three blows of the axe to get her head off. Possibly the executioner was nervous, I don't know. Apparently, her lips moved for 15 minutes after the head was off, which must have been, again, unnerving. The executioner, of course, picked up the head in the way they did, hold the head of a traitor, and that was hideously embarrassing because the auburn hair was a wig, so that he was left grasping a wig and the head, head fell back to the ground. So there was a great deal of drama about it. It cannot have been an easy day for those who took part. Mary's death was a symbolic moment in English history. It dealt a fatal blow to Catholic hopes of restoring their religion to England. And it's just as significant a turning point in the history of codes and code breaking. The decipherment of the letters between Mary and Babington is a landmark in the history of British code breaking. It's the first major step towards the great cryptographic achievements of the Royal Navy in the First World War, Bletchley Park in the Second, and GCHQ in the 1970s. In this series, we'll be encountering many of those stories and the people involved. But next week, I'll be telling a tale of a very different kind. We'll see how code breakers use their skills to unravel the mysteries of ancient Egypt.